Welcome, if you are joining us. Uh, we have already heard from Irving on some of his hot takes on film, and you heard from me uh, about my experience watching Black Panther live in concert. And so now we have Nathan with some of his thoughts on video games and the video game industry. All right. Yeah, so uh, my topic is about accessibility in video games. <clears throat> so, as I said uh, at the start of the live stream, uh, this sort of came up, uh, sort of inspired by the current game jam that I'm doing. So, for those who don't know, game jam is essentially um, a competition where you're given a certain amount of time to make a game. Usually, it's very short. It can range from like, you know, 48 hours to a week. You know, there are longer ones that like a month to stuff like that. Uh, and you're given it some some sort of theme almost always, or some limitations um, that uh, you know to, to 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 follow for your submission essentially. So each time you do a game jam, it'll probably be different. And uh, creates create it's a it's a good time. It's a good learning experience. Um, but anyways, that's beside the point. So in the game jam, uh, and I was looking at the judging categories. Um, so they judge on theme, fun, controls, graphics, audio, and accessibility. And the accessibility section says, quote, how well did the game implement features from this list? Um, and this sort of reminded me, oh, sorry, I should just explain what this list is. The list is a, a list of uh, various sort of um, accessibility features that your game uh, should have, right? So uh, it isn't, it's clear that it doesn't want you to have all of them. There are a lot of different features. It's just the features that be most relevant to your game, right? So some of them, like, uh, for example, let's see, like, support more than one input device, right? If your concept only works with the keyboard, then I assume you don't need to support more than one input device, you know? And there's a lot of stuff like that. that uh, and there's like a whole advanced section, which I assume is sort of like, you know, you really shouldn't have to do this, but if you're able to finish, you know, in time or whatever, or earlier than, than, uh, than the game jam ends, the deadline, then you can go ahead and implement these things. Uh, and it reminded me of this GDC podcast I watched about earlier so gdc all the you know they have their famous gdc talks where you know someone talks about something interesting um they also have these podcasts where um they talk but longer essentially and multiple people talking to each other about whatever topic and sometimes the topics it'd be more than one topic per podcast uh, and they're talking about accessibility and there was someone on uh from some i think accessibility organization and it was like one of the first times where like I disagreed with everything going on in the GDC uh, podcast Thanks. pretty much. Um, the whole thing was about accessibility pretty much. Uh, I don't know if I ever finished it, but all I ever got to was stuff about accessibility. Um, so, okay, what does accessibility entail? <clears throat> having, you know, I think there's sort of two parts to this. First, it's like having nothing in the game that prevents someone who's disabled from playing, right? So, example that's on the uh, the game jams page is uh people for who have speech problems right so they say you cannot have a game that requires a speech input right <clears throat> so so you can have it as a feature where that's like sort of uh it adds on to the experience but it can't be required to play the game right the second the second sort of part i think through it is um having games that are able to be enjoyed by a you know a large amount of people, regardless of whether they're disabled, and this it has more to do with stuff like the difficulty of the video game, right? So, if you have someone who's you know maybe younger who doesn't have hasn't developed their motor skills yet, um, having things that are incredibly hard to play, like you know you wouldn't give like a five year old Dark Souls to play because it would be too hard, right? Um, so, and essentially, having settings to make the game easier would be part of the accessibility thing. Uh, I don't believe that the game jam I'm doing actually has that part as part of the accessibility list, making things, you know, having easiness settings. And there are a lot of things, maybe I missed it, but at least on the podcast, they did talk about that. And I pretty much disagreed, disagreed with, yeah, wow, disagreed with what they had to say. So <clears throat> what they said was, you know, you should cater towards, uh, you know, those who would have a hard time playing your game. So, you know, I'm all, for, I'm all for having like colorblind modes or like inclusive color palettes, right? Stuff like don't like have blues and yellows together, or red and greens together, uh, because you know, or sorry, that that's part of the inclusive color palette thing. But obviously, if you're if you're an artist, right, you might want to have blues and yellows together, right? So 
having some sort of colorblind mode, which is essentially just some sort of filter you apply uh, in post-processing to the entire screen that will shift the colors one way or another is one way of doing it. Sometimes they'll it won't actually be uh, that sort of thing. It'll just change the, the colors. So instead of being yellow, it'll be a different color. It won't be a filter. It'll actually just be a different color. Right. You know, that can't really hurt the game. It requires minimal time to implement such a thing, usually, depending on the game. Um, and there's a high, you know, it's a high population of people who have that disability. So, yeah, I think it's worth doing, right? But, you know, then the question becomes where you draw the line with what things you include to help those who are disabled, right? So, for example, how are you going to cater towards blind people for video games, right? Okay, you can make an audio-only video game. I've never heard of such a thing, but I'm sure they exist. And I actually thought of, uh, of a cool concept for one. Um, but what about VR, right? VR is explicitly for people who can see. That's kind of the entire point, right? So you have a yeah. headset on that, yeah. Well, what are you going to do then, right? Is the whole genre of VR, you know, a bad genre because it's not accessible for everyone? <clears throat> what do you do if you need to cater towards a deaf person and a blind person? Well, you really have limited your options for what you can make. Whatever has to be has to be tactile, right? And what about people with tactile deficiencies? You essentially, you know, can't make any games at this point, right? Um, you know, it really doesn't take much like thought to realize you cannot do this like wholeheartedly, right? That's sort of the thing that they were saying that I disagree with. That is that you should just add accessibility, you know, settings, and all of them. You know what I'm saying? And I'm like, but you can't, right? <laughs> Some of them are contradictory contradictory towards each other and they're you know, they're not gonna you know they're not gonna be suitable for whatever game you're trying to make. So the second part that I think is a bit more interesting is having games that have uh, settings you know for for easier play, right? Okay, you know the first problem is how do you implement this in a multiplayer setting? Are you gonna you know you can't have someone who can you know, some master of the game who can decide how easy the game is, right? Because then you're changing the experience for everyone, and that might not be what everyone wants. Uh, so, you know, you could have, say, several game modes that, you know, scale in easiness um, and, you know, try to make them as granular as possible or whatever. But then you're going to end up fracturing your player base into multiple queues for, you know, finding a game and it's going to skyrocket your queue times, and uh, that's no good. In single player, it's you know actually not that simple as simple as you would think, right? So uh, the GDC guy was talking about um, difficulty sliders and stuff like that, which is you know some games let you, for example, let's say you're playing like an FPS, right? And you have some enemy AI, right, who's attacking you or whatever. Some games will let you change sliders like on how well they are at taking cover or how well they are at hitting you, actually, right? Their accuracy, I guess. Um, Okay, so, I mean, now you're asking the player to balance the game. That is not going to turn out well. <laughs> there, there's a reason why, you know, you pay people to do that for you, right? It's You have a game designer, right, or a level designer, depend, depending on what you're trying to balance, whatever. Uh, you don't tell your programmers to go and, you know, figure out how much ammo belongs in this weapon, right? That's a problem. <laughs> because, especially if you're if you're playing the game, right, and you are likely to be changing the difficulty settings when you start playing the game, right? which means you don't know what the game is going to be like. So you're going to be changing sliders based on expectation and not based on reality. Right? And you know, this assumes that some games don't let you change the difficulty mid-game. Example would be like, um, uh, say, RimWorld. I'm pretty sure you cannot change the difficulty, of the, like, or the storyteller, as they call it, mid-game. It's just because a lot of that stuff, like, programmatically thinking about it, I'm like, I don't even know how you, like, it can get complicated. Um, having to change the difficulty, you know, it's not as simple as being like, you know, AI or it could be as simple as the AI, right? Just reducing their, their spread cone for their shots in an FPS, right? But if you're changing the way the AI moves, for example, to make it easier, well, that's a bigger undertaking now, right? Um, so oh, like Hearts of Iron, I'm pretty sure you can't change the difficulty of the AI mid game. I, you know, have to do is change I, your your variable, bro. You know, just like <laughs> just change, change the it from a ten to a two. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. Why didn't Why didn't they think of that? I wonder. <laughs> yeah, it's just not that simple, unfortunately. Um, it's a you know a game is is in part a challenge, right? Like, if a game isn't challenging, you know, it tends to not be very fun, right? It tends to be. Yeah, I mean, there are some you know oddities like idle games which I, I really don't get it like it breaks all laws of game design and maybe <laughs> for some people people some for some reason people like them i don't know i don't know how people can have fun with them but 
I guess I guess in those cases, okay, you can have a uh, <clears throat> you can say that challenge isn't required, right? But for the most part, right? For standard games, I like uh, a challenge anyway. Like I've been playing solitaire. I want it to be hard, you know. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I I only play like the hardest difficulty in the solitaire. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Right. Like, uh, yeah, there's something like like Dark Souls that w- if Dark Souls were easy. Dark Souls would not be nearly as like you know popular a game. The entire like thing about it, right, is that it's extremely hard. That's like, <laughs> that's like what it's known for, right? It's it's a big challenge for people who are who want to take it, right? And if you can't do that, then yeah, that's okay. There are plenty of other games, you know, even when similar Dark Souls out there for you, right? Um, so okay, so uh, you know, if you don't want your players to balance the game for themselves, which is you know obviously a bad idea in my opinion, um. Then you can have, you know, what some games do is have variable, var- various presets for difficulty. So they may have an easy, normal, hard mode, or you know, I have a hardcore mode, whatever it is, right? And this changes, you know, some a bunch of different variables uh, in the game that make the game easier, or harder. All right. Okay. First problem with this, this is going to take a lot of work, right? Because as we went, you know, went over before, is that balancing is not easy. All right. You have to hire people to do this. So now you have to hire people to make three different, if you have easy, medium, hard, three different modes, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and you might have this sort of problem where none of these exactly even fit a particular player, right? The normal mode is too hot, hard, and the easy mode is too easy, for example. That would still be a problem if you only had one mode, but it's like now you've developed three things and you're not even going to solve the problem for everyone anyways, you know? Uh, so, you know, the, the problem can get very complicated. So let's take the FPS as an example again, right? Let's say there are, I don't know, health potions you can take, right? And it restores your health by somewhat. So you decide, okay, how can I make this game easier? Add more health potions scattered around, right? That you pick up and use. Okay, so you add more health potions. Let's say you can store these health potions in your inventory and you have a certain amount of inventory spaces, say 10 items or something like that, right? Okay, well, the problem is that you make the game harder because the player is not picking up more health potions and has less room for other things, and they may not realize that they need those other things potentially more. You know, they don't they don't get the, uh, like, because health potions seem so abundant, they think, oh, I need a lot of these, you know what I'm saying? The game is giving me a lot of them, I need a lot of these, and they end up, you know, neglecting everything else, right? This is part of the, you know, unintended consequences you might face. Okay, so you decide I can fix this problem. We add more inventory spaces. If we have more inventory spaces, people will be less likely to just leave things behind. They'll grab them because they have more space. All right. Okay, so you increase the inventory space. Now, what if this creates an entirely unintended play style? For example, let's t- let's say ammo takes up some amount of inventory space. So you add a ten. You, let's say you add ten uh, additional inventory spaces to the original ten. Say twenty now. Right. What if the new strategy that works is to forego all all health potions and instead just acquire the rare ammo that of the i don't know of a very powerful weapon and you amass that right and now you're essentially a glass cannon right you are able to destroy everything and nothing can touch you pretty much you know you really didn't intend to create that play style but you did by only by simply adding health potions and increasing the inventory space and this is going to go on this in a huge cycle of just Okay, how do I fix this problem? Oh, I do this thing, which creates another problem. So I do this thing. It's going to keep going over and over and over again, which is, you know, once again, why you pay someone to balance your games. Okay, and aside from, you know, balancing problems, it can be a programmatic nightmare too. So, for example, imagine having different presets for difficulties for a racing game. Racing AI is, you know, not simple at all, you know. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to explain why it'd be hard without, like, getting technical, but... I guess the uh, a very high level way of explaining is just that the AI doesn't have much hard data to work with. I guess, um, and there's a lot of things happening very fast um, and stuff like that. But so you know, having to yeah. edit an AI that may already be fickle to deal with is uh, not going to be a simple task necessarily programmatically, you know, depending on the game. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that doesn't just be, that's not just in, in uh, racing games, right? How do you make uh, certain enemies and FPSs easier while still making them seem human, right? Like, yeah, there's a point at which the AI just looks dumb and doesn't look human, right? Uh, kind of the point of having artificial intelligence in some cases is to make it seem like you're actually, you know, dealing with a real human as best as you can. 
Um, aside from it taking more work to implement multiple presets, uh, you're also trusting the player to give themselves the appropriate difficulty, which I kind of talked about before in that, you know, you're asking the players to balance your game, but this is different with the presets. It's like, okay, let's say I can handle, maybe maybe for me, uh, the normal game mode is what would be most fun for me. But going into it, you know, I start playing a little bit. Let's say this is one of the games where you can change your difficulty setting. Start playing it, you know, I'm kind of losing a little bit. I'm like, all right, let's set this to easy, right? Well, I'm kind of shooting myself in the foot here, right? Like, I might, I might think that I want the easy, that, that the easy game mode would be more fun for me, but maybe that actually ends up being more boring. But I don't realize it because in my brain, I'm thinking easier must be better, right? Like, if I don't have these problems or whatever, right? Um, you, you know, like, don't trust the player, right? <laughs> uh, um, there are a lot of things that games just prevent you from doing just to save yourself, essentially, right? Because if you're left to your own devices without certain rules, you'd end up destroying the game for yourself. Um, and this is sort of one of those things where having an easier game mode might hurt. And if you don't have the ability to change the game mode mid-game, well, you're telling the player to choose a game mode based on a game that they haven't played yet, and they can't, you know, they can't change it mid-game, they're locked into whatever they've chosen, which may, may be too hard or too easy for them, right? Um, you know, there's also the other solution, aside from presets and having the variable sliders, uh, of having some sort of um, the game sort of learning how well you're doing at the game, right? So maybe, you know, it's a game where you have a match and each match has a certain amount of, you know, points. You, you they have a certain amount of points you, you know, you acquire by the end of the game. So if the game sees you're not really making that many points by the end of the game, it'll start making it easier for you, you know, gradually behind the scenes without necessarily even telling you or the other way around. Forza sort of does this in a way, except it tells you. It says, like, if you, if you lose a certain amount of matches in a row, it just says, like, yo, we can make the game easier for you if you want, and you can just say yes or no, right? Uh, I think if you start winning, it'll tell you we can make the game harder for you, yes or no, and then you can choose to do so. Um, but what was the point I was making with this? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that can be uh, very costly to, uh, you know, time-consuming to do um, to make something that, you know, because if it's just something, something simple as winning or losing a race, it's very simple to program, right? Did you get first place or not? All right. And if you didn't get first place or, or you did get first place this amount of time, this many times in a row, then we prompt you, right? It can be more complicated. Um, and I'll go back to the FPS example, right? Well, let's say it's an objective-based FPS, right? There are many things that can factor into score, right? Let's say you're doing the objective, right? But you're still losing for some reason, right? Well. The game has to figure out why you're losing. Is it because it took you too long to do the objective? Is it because the enemy was killing you too often? Whatever it is, right? Because it might end up making the wrong part easier, uh, and then that doesn't really help your case. Um, or it might end up making the wrong part harder, whatever it is, right? So, yeah, that can be a very uh, hard thing to do. Um, and there are also certain types of games where having easier settings is not even a possibility. Take puzzle games, for example, like Portal or, um, you know, Dead Space, which is somewhat puzzly, right? What, how do you make, like, what, are you going to make a whole new map set or a whole new level set of just easier things? Well, it's going to take a long time to make the game again, but just easier, or make the game again, but just harder. Um, and that is oftentimes impractical. So I think... You know, let the game fill the spot that it's meant to fill. If the game is meant to be hard, let it be hard. If the game is meant to be easy, let it be easy. If the game is meant to fill an entire, you know, large space because it can do that based on the mechanics it has, then let it do that as well, right? Um, yeah, I have no problem with easy games. I have no problems with high accessibility games, of course. Um, you know, given the, the, the studio has the budget to lengthen their production time in order to implement such things then go for it right as long as it doesn't ruin the the experience um at least not in any meaningful way you know otherwise it's like saying that like horror movies should accommodate for children for example right i mean that's gonna be pretty hard <laughs> uh and it's you know potentially going to ruin the experience for any non-child in the in the room you know um it's meant to be a horror movie. It's meant to be for older audiences. And it's the same thing for the other way around for kids' movies, right? Maybe it's not meant to be, you know, very entertaining for adults. And that's okay because that's, that's the space it fills. Um, 
But then there are also movies that are good for both adults and, you know, just a wider range of ages because the, the, the concept of the story or whatever just works that way. And that's okay. You know? Um, so all in all for this, for, for game jams, you don't need to put such an ex- extensive list of accessibility items uh, or even judge on it, you know, at all, in my opinion, most of them on the list were not important enough to worry about in the time, in the span of time a game jam gives you. This one is nine days long. That is not a long time to create a game. <laughs> you know, it may cause game jammers to prioritize the wrong things because, you know, they may not realize, okay, well, on this entire massive list of 50 different accessibility items, which one do I even pick to, to, to do, you know? And they might end up picking the wrong, wrong thing, you know? Um, and yeah, we don't have the luxury of time to figure it out necessarily. I think it should be decided on a game if you decide to even judge it, it should be decided on a game per game basis i hope they don't do it in such a way which i feel like they might where it's like okay how many items on this list did you check off and they're like okay there's so many part points you get for this category because like if if your game has you know if you have a game with two buttons in it right so one of the things on the list was having button remapping i guess that's accessible for people who for example are left-handed and might uh prefer using IJKL for movement instead of WASD, uh, which apparently not all left-handed people do that. I know that some people just learn because, you know, most mice are right-handed, so they just end up using their left hand for the keyboard anyways. But anyways, (laughs) Um, yeah, if you have a game with two buttons, is button remapping really that important? No, (laughs) because, you know, there's not going to be, what are you going to remap it to? Another two buttons anywhere? It's going to be the same thing anyways, (laughs) you know? you know, when you remap it, remap keys is usually because, you know, maybe you have a game that uses WASD and uses like the common other keys like Q, E, R, F, C, X, Z, those ones, right? All around the WASD, right? Maybe you have, like, I hate when games have like G B something. And I'm like, that's kind of a little too far away to deal with. If, you know, if possible, I'd rather make it F, E, or anything else closer to the WASD buttons, right? This is because there are already a lot of buttons. If there are only two buttons, say A and S, what am I going to change it to K and L? It's the same thing. It's just in a different spot, which is not going to be very useful at all. At all. So, uh, yeah, you know, if you have a game with twenty buttons, okay, now button remapping becomes way, way bigger priority. Like button remapping on a game with twenty buttons is like exponentially greater of a <laughs> of a thing, especially on. You know, it's more important for. It's actually why you see button remapping more on um, PC games than you see on console games, or even games that are cross-platform. Some of them will lock the buttons on a console controller because a console controller really doesn't have that many buttons to begin with, you know, that are used at least, right? Like, you know, usually D-pad is is, is left for, like, extra things that aren't used too many times. Then you have left stick, and then you have your four buttons, and then you have triggers, and that makes up, you know, a large amount of games. And occasionally they'll shove in the right stick as well, but you know there really aren't that many possibilities you can have, right? Um, and because everyone has the, you know, I don't are there are there? I assume there are. Let's say they're left-handed controllers. They probably are. But because I assume, you know Xboxes and Playstations don't ship with left-handed controllers, uh, it's not really a. Uh, well, you know, you know, most people are using the same exact thing, anyways. You know, so you don't have to worry about about key binding and stuff like that. I think it's a bad message to give that accessibility stuff like this are required. So, um, yeah, I hope that what I was trying to say is that I hope that when they judge these things, they do it on a per game basis. That's like, okay, this game has two buttons. We don't really care if you added button remapping. If it has 20, well, now we care. You know, I have a feeling they might not do that. Um, I, you know, the way they did say, they didn't, they never specified that, right? I have a feeling it's literally just going on checklists. All right, what are the, which, ones are these, which one of these are relevant, you know? Which one, which one of these, you know, uh, do we give you points for? Going back to the example I mentioned in the beginning about speech, right? Well, what if your game is about speech? Like, I don't know what to tell you. Like, <laughs> well, let them make the game, right? Let them be interesting. That's, that's an interesting game concept, that having a game that requires speech. I've never seen that before. <laughs> let, let them have that, right? And it's like, it's like how uh, Irving rates his movies, right? It's like, it's for what it is, right? Okay, not everyone can play the game, but for what it is, it's a good game, you know? But, uh, yeah, that's all I have to say, pretty much. What I learned just now is that you are a bigot. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) I don't like disabled people. But for the record, I am colorblind, so, like, yeah. (laughs) You can't can't say anything about that. Yeah, well, 
<laughs> I'm sure there's yeah, some no, excuse I, people can make to hate on you. <laughs> that makes sense. I mean, like when I when I was a kid, I mean, the only basically the only video game I played was Pokemon because I could play it. You know, like I wasn't gonna. I mean, I, and it was less frustrating to like die in Pokemon die like you know, in quotations you know you go back to pokemon hospital but like it's i don't know i think it's like accessible for kids obviously it's accessible enough for me that can't play video games to save my life and obviously older people like it too i don't know but like not every game has to fill that space yeah it's, it's like kind a, of uh, surprising to me that they even started down that kind of bunny hole you know of like here's an exhaustive list of things that are accessible that sounds well, obviously it's impossible <laughs> yeah, yeah if i mean, have I, anything for blind people because like <laughs> that's very hard <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think I think like those are two separate categories. Like the, you know, accessibility for like disabilities is is I think more important than like trying to make your like your game you know ch- challenging enough for everyone. I just because it, I think every almost every bit of me you know every kind of media, are just you know is, is going to face that. Like that's why there are children's books and young adult literature. You know, and like the different things, and you, you know, you can't try and you can. Some books are popular with you know a broad range of audiences, but not everything has to be that way. Agreed. I mean, it would be like saying my movie needs to. Well, yeah, my movie needs to appeal to all, all audiences, no matter the age, no matter like whatever demographics or whatever, and also it needs to be like enjoyable by like people who are both blind and deaf. And it's like, okay, well. Is is this the same medium anymore? It's like there's like yeah, like you said, like there's some basic, easy decency that you can do, and if it's in your like echelon to do that, like you know, not everyone can spend the money to title their entire film. You know, like Op- Operation First Light is not titled, right? I've never ever captioned the entire thing so that it's accessible, but it's also like not. I, I don't feel bad about that either because, uh, you know, it's not like I'm putting it out, out there for general consumption. And it's also not as if it's that uh, kind of thing. You know, it's not a triple A experience or anything like that. So, yeah. For the record, I do not have a colorblind mode in my in my own game that I'm making for this game jam. <laughs> but I don't have that kind of time. <laughs> right. And also, yeah. I'm not doing button remapping. There's like, there are four buttons on the keyboard and two buttons on the mouse or sorry five buttons on the keyboard two buttons on the mouse will need okay well obviously i mean you're not going to rebind the two buttons on the mouse that just makes sense <laughs> left mouse button right mouse button there's wasd and spacebar very uh standard things if you're left-handed then you use ijkl i'm sorry i just can't i don't have that kind of time <laughs> yeah and i you know it's like i could you know be playing to win and work less on the on, on what i think is more important in this scenario which is uh, stuff like art, which I have not really gotten to, and I need to do that, <laughs> uh, and work more on accessibility stuff in order to you know, appease the judges. But like, I'm more interested in making a good game and less interested in, in, uh, in winning. So I'm sorry with me. Yeah, makes sense. All right, uh, news? I have that news I sent in Discord, uh, I guess, which I don't know if it's so new anymore, but uh, about um, GTA's, GTA is a, on the PlayStation YouTube channel, posted a video of gta and it has like what was it 17 only 17 percent uh likes or something like that and i got like mass uh disliked the reason being is that it's um it's for gta 5 like remastered for next gen consoles right uh, people are just like just make gta 6 bro but <laughs> it's been a long it's been extremely long and you know it's just funny seeing people in the comments being like i started playing this when the game came out I was in high school. Now I graduated college or something like that. Or like, you know, <laughs> when when um, when this game came out, like I think someone was like, my girlfriend's uh, sister quit, wasn't even born yet, and now I can have conversations with her. I was like, <laughs> it's kind of funny. But uh, <laughs> yeah, um, it's been some time. And people just keep saying, stop milking. Like, the, like this thing is like, I don't know. It's old. Stop milking it. <laughs> Make a new game. But the funny part is, like, is there an incentive? Is there an incentive to make a new game if people are just buying it anyways? Because 
in theory, people are still buying it, right? I think GTA 5 is still one of the most played games on Steam. might be top 10. Um, it's, you know, I can check that. But, um, yeah, I guess there's not really any monetary incentive for them to make a new one if people are... Oh, it's number 10 exactly, actually. And, it, like, it's crazy. It gains and loses players every month. Like, I don't know, dude. Last month, it, it's at, it lost, on average, 27,000 players. Two months before that, it gained twenty four thousand. A couple months before that, thirty it gained thirty thousand. A couple months before that, it lost twenty thousand. That's insane, <laughs> considering uh, currently there are about fifty thousand people playing. That's half of its player base just shifting randomly. I don't know how that happens, but uh, <laughs> oh, well, it's because they because they keep adding random things, right? Uh, adding events probably and stuff like that, which is how they sort of milk it because a lot of them have to buy. So yeah, I mean, it wasn't a long time before the event between gta 4 and 5 anyway like i remember there was like the first three gta's i believe were all made in one console generation cycle the last what are we on we're on four on five i think between four and five was like i guess that was a long time well, yeah i think that was a long I long mean, time i assume it should as the technology gets greater because gta is some, some of, like gta is uh some uh I mean, let's say some nice technology. Some of us, I mean, I mean, it's just inverse kinematics. <laughs> it's uh, it's nice, nice animations, ni- nice um, ragdolling, I should say, uh, using inverse kinematics. Uh, I assume at least that's what it uses, regardless of what it uses. It, I guess it's nice, um, but like it's a bit old news now, you know. I mean, I guess not many games still do this, but like, I mean, it's not that they couldn't do that. It's just that it's not necessarily applicable to their games, you know. Or, or something that they would do given the time it takes to do, essentially. Maybe, you know, make a new game, make a new game with, like, improved, you know, even greater technologies, you know, so that, you know, because I feel like GTA, when it came out, was probably fairly impressive and stuff like that. But now, you know, they're just saying in this remastered version has better graphics, whatever. And, you know, note that, like, this version has probably been accessible on PC for a very long time <laughs> because, uh, you know, console standards, but, you know. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I have. Oh, any... also, sorry, oh, real quick. No, they also ahead. just released Red Dead Redemption Two, not mm-hmm. that long ago. So you can't really blame them for not releasing GTA. Like they just finished the game, bro. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you guys, you could say like, even like even before they should have before they released uh, RDR Two, they should have released GTA Six. Okay, maybe. But like, given that they just released Red Dead Redemption Two, I guess they weren't working on GTA Six, or at least it was a background task or something like that. So. I kind of get why they wouldn't release it immediately afterwards. Yeah, for me, I don't think there's anything particularly interesting happening in the film world. I was seeing uh, this interesting uh, thing. I don't know, have you seen the movie Drive, Ben? That, that's a hot take I have in and of itself. That movie's terrible. But, you know. <laughs> uh, apparently, is the music noteworthy? Apparently, musicians are recalling its innovative soundtrack. But it was, for me, very boring retro wave kind of stuff. So I, mm-hmm. I don't really even... I think it was that interesting. Very boring movie in overall, in my opinion. Pretty pictures sometimes, though. So I guess mm. there's that. Anything in the music world? I feel like there's something that I'm not thinking of at the moment. I have heard a lot, like going right into video games. I, I think I mentioned this in Discord too. I've been hearing a lot about the um, maybe just because I'm such a you know Star Wars fan, but uh, uh, remaking um, Knights of the Old Republic, which I know. It's been discussed for a while. I think it's official now that they're doing it and they're going to update it for a modern audience, which people, I think, are some people are upset about. Scary phrases these EA, days. So I'm pretty sure it won't be EA who's doing this one. Any EA studio. Interesting. Yeah, I don't know anything about those games, so. <laughs> yeah, I believe I, Bioware made the last one, which, uh, or I guess the one, which, uh, I think is owned by EA. I could be wrong. All I know about it is that for Star Wars fans who like video games, which is, which is not me, but that it has a reputation of being like by far the greatest Star Wars game ever, and it, a lot of people that put it up pretty high on their list of favorite games. So yeah, it's one of the highest reviewed games of all time. I don't really know anything about it myself, but ninety four on Metacritic. That's not something that happens normally. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of a lot of people I, I've encountered who are fanatically devoted to it, and you know, still playing it. Even what eighteen? I think it came in two thousand three, maybe eighteen years later. Dang. 
That's pretty insane. <laughs> That's pretty impressive. I mean, I'm I'm sure they're about to trash it though. <laughs> Is it? I mean, not even just because of what you said just before, but because like the expectations are probably like ridiculously high, and there's probably no way they can meet them. <laughs> I'm sure. Um, especially if they don't drag some people on who are part of the original team to try to capture some of the what was good about it before. Oh wait, there was a okay. How many Knights of the Old Republic are there? Do you know? There, are, there are a couple of sequels to it, but they we're talking about like the original one. It yeah, it's called Knights of the Old Republic. Because yeah, the second one wasn't made. By, the first one's made by Bioware. The second one doesn't seem to have been. Uh, oh, also. <laughs> Interesting that uh, as a publisher on Steam, Lucas Arts has changed their name to Lucas Arts, comma Disney, comma Lucas Film. What? <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yeah, and clicking on the link brings you to some thing called Obsidian Entertainment. What is that? <laughs> what? Uh, Increased bureaucracy. <laughs> Wait, that's the studio, not the... So the developer... Okay, so on the Steam page for Knights of the Old Republic 2, developer is Obsidian Entertainment, publisher is LucasArts, comma, Disney, comma, Lucasfilm. I just want to see what they make, what like other things they published out of curiosity, right? But it brings you to the developer what, uh, thing instead, so I don't really know what's up with that. All right, is that it for news, pretty much? I guess so. All right, well, uh, thank you for joining us again for this week on Mixed Media. I will say that I will make a last pitch for mixedmedia.locals.com. That's Mixed Media, our name, dot locals, that's L-O-C-A-L-S, dot com. It's basically like Patreon. I'm going to, this week, hopefully, I've, I think I have a window of, of, of uh, free space to work on the podcast stuff this week. We'll see. We'll see. No promises. But if I get a chance, I will update the um, tiers on locals so that it's clear what you get in each tier. In the lowest tier right now, which is definitely not going to be the case forever, that light, light board is going to be accessible to you if you join at the lowest tier. And all that money will go into funding our uh, debut on Rumble Live, hopefully, before everyone, anyone else can get on the scene. We just want one backer so that we, yeah, we have someone on our side, on our back, co-signing the endeavor. Um, and from there, we can grow and expand. I think it's, it'll be a good idea. Uh, besides that, we have a Discord link in the description. A uh, whole bunch of links in the description. Just check it out there if you're curious if we have something. Likely we do. Uh, just check it out in the description. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. We're here every Friday at 7 p.m. Anything else? And 4, 4 p.m. Pacific time. Right, yeah. 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 <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, so uh, shout out to uh, all of you out there who are watching on different platforms. Shout out to people on our podcasting platforms. Uh, yeah, we'll uh, catch you later. Yeah, thanks for listening. Thanks. Bye.